sort of see you. Uh, you're, you're, uh, Sorry, I have, it, yeah, I have it very kind of dramatic here. <laughs> you're, you're giving me that one tunnel look. Yeah, well, you know, there's something about the shadows. I don't know, you know? Yeah, well, we, we live in the shadows. I, I think that's, that's, that's what it is. So, Greg, I'm, I'm really happy to have this conversation with you. Of course, we've known each other for some time, and uh, I've been a fan of your work, and um, I think it's really, it, this is going to be a really interesting conversation for us, and we had a prelude to this. I don't, we had a, a little conversation as well. Yep. Um, and uh, I say, you, you know, you're a guy that really, really loves uh, letters, typography, um, as well as graffiti lettering. So before we jump in and start, <clears throat> I'm going to switch the screen over so I can take a minute to read just a quick one paragraph sure. your bio for the folks who may not know you or your work. Um, so uh, uh, it reads, inspired by the dynamism of his native New York City, Greg LaMarche's collages combine the city's relentless rhythm and graffiti's aggressive presence to express the power, elegance, and rebelliousness of urban creativity. <laughs> Using found materials and commercially printed papers from his vast collection of vintage printed matter, LaMarche abstracts, graffiti visual, abstracts graffiti's visual language, playing with, the, with a profusion of font styles, word fragments, multiple layers, bold colors, rhythmic repetition, multiple perspectives, and movement. Each unique work is precisely hand-cut paper, thus becomes an interplay of the directness of graphic design and aesthetics of fine art. Uh, there's more to say, but we'll cover the rest of it. And uh, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of that one. Yeah, yeah you have. I mean, it's, it, it, it explains it pretty well. Uh, yeah. But uh, another thing that I do appreciate this, and, and, I, and, and as we look at a very, very early work of yours, uh, as a young child, um, what I was, as, as I think about the contemporary work, um, I, it brings me back to the genesis, right? Uh, the child's play of collage making, of, of writing letters and stuff like that. Um, so uh, you were born in Queens. Yeah. And uh, uh, Flushing, Queens. Well, no, not Flushing, Forest Hills. Uh, or Forest Hills, forgive me. Yeah. Okay. And so, okay. so, um, Got love for flushing. Yeah, we, we got love for flushing too. Uh, so, Greg, when you were coming up, um, what is it about graffiti or, or, or typography that caught your interest? Well, I think, you know, like, like a lot of us that grew up in the 70s, um, you know, graffiti was on everything. I mean, I went to grade school, uh, pre-kindergarten to sixth grade, uh, which is like roughly 1974 to 1981. And not one time was the schoolyard ever buffed or cleaned during that time. So you spend a lot of time outside as a kid and you spend a lot of time lining up outside. And, and so you just kind of, it just, we, we lived in a time where like, it just was always there. As long as I can remember from first grade, it was always there. And so if, at a certain point by the early eighties, ev everyone wrote graffiti. Uh, everyone had a tag and everyone wrote, everyone hung out in the schoolyard and everyone wrote in the schoolyard. And so um, that's really kind of where it, it came from, was really just living during that time when graffiti was just so prevalent on everything, you know? And then be, and how were you able to kind of decipher style, so to speak, as you're, as you're looking out at all this stuff? Like, you, you know, again, part of it is we look at these things and we identify with them and then we try to find an identity with it, within them, right? And you see the writing, you pick a, you pick well, a name, yeah. you pick I mean, a name, so to speak, right? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things that I could, I could say as kind of like a, a, you know, one of the first things that I really noticed about graffiti. But one of the things that always stuck with me is that in the schoolyard where I went to, to grade school, which is PS 101, uh, on top of the auditorium where, you know, where the, 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 the roof was, all the all the the clay bricks there, there was a huge area where the clay bricks were just you know non non not there it was just this kind of like big dark area of tar and tyvek and up there really crudely in white spray paint someone wrote we don't need ladders and so that was like the first thing they're like oh shit people climb up the drain pipe to go get you know a roofed frisbee or a super pinky or a tennis ball or whatever it was back then and so that was the first thing that really kind of like got me to notice graffiti and then shortly after that I could, you know, in fourth and fifth grade, you could understand the rock band logo. You saw the Van Halen logo or the Who or Led Zeppelin or what have you. And you could read those. 
at the time I couldn't really read a lot of the tags, you know. But also, but you were looking at them in the neighborhood and, and the trains, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I like it. Like in 1981, I basically started to kind of like write with my friends in the neighborhood. And that's kind of when we started. And the picture that you have up right now is actually also, that's, I'd say that's probably 1982. And that's just a photo of the four train going by Yankee Stadium. Uh, in the early 80s, we used to go to a bunch of Yankee games with my dad. And um, so I, I didn't really see the number trains growing up. So like all that classic stuff in the late 70s, stuff, I wasn't really into graffiti that way until early 80s. But when I went to Yankee Stadium, I would, I would spend a lot of time just benching the four trains and taking some kind of crappy pictures. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I became a big fan of like you know, Band 2 and you know, Delhi 167. And then of course this Mitch piece, which is you know, still to me one of the, just the most amazing pieces just in colors, concept, placement, uh, just everything. It's just, it's, it's still, to me, this is such a strong piece, even to this day. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting, cause, and people will see this as we continue our conversation, how this plays out in your own personal work. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, I, just... I emulated the colors and things from this piece. I tried to make, even though I didn't use any of those letters in my name, I tried to make those shapes into my letters. Yeah, yeah. I, I get it. I get it. And I and I and I like that you, you presented us with this image because like I said, all around it speaks to where you ended up later in life, uh, both with graffiti, typography and design. Uh, but you 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 mentioned you had a you know short period of bombing on trains from like what was it eighty four? Well, yeah, I mean, I basically like I said, I, I basically was a neighborhood writer, and like I you know when I started writing in eighty one, obviously I was you know a novice. I, I rode on a train in nineteen eighty two for the first time on Union Turnpike Station with an El Marco. You know what I mean? So like I was just really feeling it out, and I was you know I was thirteen, fourteen, whatever. But yeah, over time. Uh, yeah, I started to get more into it. And so in, I'd say, yeah, between 85 and 88 is probably the most active I was on the trains. But even then, I was more, uh, I was more like a bomber as a vandal. I did insides, I did throw ups, I did very few pieces. Uh, the thing about the time, that time, like 85 and on, is that there were so many people writing graffiti, and there was such a, a you know, a fight for space. And yeah. so it didn't really even seem to make sense sometimes to do pieces for me because a I'd be going to layups with like nine or 10 guys and we would grill the whole side of the thing with throw ups. And if I was like kind of left behind doing a piece, I, I would, there'd be no room for me to do fill-ins everywhere. So it was a kind of more, it became more of a competitive thing, you know? Right. And this, I think this photograph really kind of emphasizes that, right? The competition for space. Um, yeah, yeah. At, the year says a lot because this is sort of after the style war years, but into like, really like this is kind of like the, you know, the final throws of the graffiti yeah, well, movement. This is, this is 88. So this is very much towards the end. And as a matter of fact, this was done in the M yard. And there were, there were clean trains in the M yard at the time. And I can remember a worker coming up to us and say, hey, don't write on the clean trains. And we're like, don't worry, we're not because, you know, we didn't want to blow the spot because we were going there quite a bit. Right. So, but, but this time, it's interesting because at, at this time, 88, you're... Are, are you already at music and art at this time? Mm. Uh, look, well, no, I, yeah, I graduated. I graduated music and art in '87, and I started. Okay. Doing, so, so, like this tag, this is from '87. Uh, so we spent a lot of the lines that I hit. Like I, I didn't really hit the number lines. I, I, I mostly hit the lines in Queens and and Brooklyn. Like for whatever reason, just growing up back in Queens, then it was just th th there was just a big connection between Brooklyn and Queens because like all you had to do was jump on the uh, Interboro Parkway. And like you're in East New York and there was tunnels and yards and there's just stuff everywhere. So it's like, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff was, you know, like I said, it was more like, you know, M trains and uh, R N, N trains and B trains and R trains and stuff like that is what I was saying. Yeah. So, Greg, what can, what, what can you tell us about having this kind of uh, impulse, right, just to brand yourself and, and just vandalize trains and streets? Well, I was into it. I mean, I, you know, one of the things I should probably say is that, you know, what I grew up looking at, you know, my home station was Continental Avenue on the E and F train and the first stop on the GG in Queens. So I spent an inordinate amount of time kind of in, in, in essence studying those trains. I mean, the, the amazing thing about the GG trains is that they would switch up with the CCs 
Yes. And they would park, they would park uptown, they would park in Rockaway, they park in the Queens Boulevard. And so you would have just like this mix up of hand styles from the Bronx and from uptown in Brooklyn and Queens. And so I very much gravitated towards the insides and the hand of the, those old GG clunkers. Uh, and, and also I have to say that, you know, back then the E's and F's were being absolutely crushed by RTW, TPA, uh, and TKC. So yeah. I, I could speak a whole show about those three crews alone, and just their influence on me. But in a nutshell, those three crews, I think, really shaped what what I really liked about graffiti and, you know, how I looked at throw ups and, and hand, handwriting and stuff like that. And even like simple styles and pieces. I mean, just watching that unfold, uh, you know, was, you know, amazing. <laughs> yeah, and, and the one thing, too, that I, I would say about those lines, uh, especially Queens and the Far Rockaway lines, um, there were some great throw-up writers. Um, I, yeah. I, I think some of the greatest ones came off of that line. Uh, well, I mean, I, I always kind of look at the, you know, it's funny, I always look at the letter lines and the BMTs and, and some of those as more like the blue-collar lines, because they... You know, you had you had the IRTs, which had all these you know amazing, colorful, and and you know incredible artworks, but the the J trains and the M trains and that, they had these you know blockbuster silvers and just top to bottom silvers. I, I can remember distinctly the Lookout Crew, uh, EK and JO, and of course Baby One Sixty Eight and POSIS. Um, these guys just absolutely just trashed these lines and did throw ups and top to bottoms and. And that was that was that was exciting to watch because that was mostly what I saw when I was growing up. And also, uh, it, it, it of course uh, it, it's important to say too, since the times have changed, it wasn't the time for you know that you go to the layup and you spend five hours on one piece. No, I mean it would be about volume. I mean you know we would go to Astoria, and if you could hit both ends of the layup, there would be six sets there. So you could maybe, if you were lucky and didn't get interrupted, you could maybe do 40, 50 fill-ins or more a night. I mean, I, I used to paint with a guy who wrote, who writes AI, KSW, and uh, shout out to him. And he, he's one of the most, uh, he's one of these guys that kind of had a sixth sense about bombing. He just knew, he knew how to, how to do it. And, and he did more throw-ups than, whenever I went painting with him in, in tunnels or layups, he did more throw-ups than anybody. So there's something interesting that we all develop, well, many of us develop about the act of writing and, 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 and putting up our tags and throw ups or pieces is that this kind of uh, uh, unique sense of messaging and placement and branding. Well, yeah, well, hey, growing up in Queens, the highways was a big, yep. big thing. And so this was, this was a really, really great spot on the LAE right by Woodhaven Boulevard that I don't know if you can see it or people can see it on the screen, but a lot of the stuff that's in there is, is old quick throw-ups and Saks RTW throw-ups. And there's like quick KD or quick RTW. And uh, there's, there's some really magical stuff that's going on in there. Um, and so I, we really came in on, on the, the tail end of that, you know, because, I mean, when we started writing, a lot of things were still running on highways and stuff like that. But by the time, you know, by the mid, mid late 80s, highways started just getting annihilated right so you know at that point you caught wind uh, it's interesting because this is a nice little transition because by there's a point you go to music and art right you you yes. go uh, to the school an art kind of an arts related school um and of course you're full-fledged graffiti writer that's your central interest so to speak as a kid yes uh, and you you you're surrounded by graffiti writers and and you mentioned um to me that when you were in school in particular there were you know two crews that uh one being fc yep um, and the other one fwd yep um and so given that you're in school and you're you're kind of now broadening your connections your networking, right, so to speak, um, and and you kind of get deeper into the world of graffiti. What were you kind of forecasting for yourself? Like, where do I go with this, or what 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 happens after high school? Oh no, I don't th I don't think I was that focused at all back then. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just knew that I wanted to get up. I wanted to paint. I was in, you know, I was just really in the full throes of of that. I mean, I like I said, I, I think eighty seven, eighty eight was probably where I was 
doing graffiti the most in my life. And uh, so, you know, going to high school was like pretty secondary. I mean, it's kind of amazing that I graduated on time because, you know, I would cut school, we would break night, we'd go out and paint, uh, go to various labs, we'd go to Coney Island or 175th or East New York or Astoria or wherever. And, uh, you know, I would, you know, my, my parents would get, you know, messages back from my teachers, like, hey, your son is falling asleep in class <laughs> and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I, uh, I definitely was, you know, very much absent for high school uh, because I was just, yeah, I was just so wrapped up in it. But, but something, something uh, really kind of woke you up to something much more, uh, well, I think, um, how do you put it, uh, uh, purposeful um, once you, you graduated, right? Because you, you, you mentioned you ended up going to Franklin Pierce I did, uh, yes. af after high school and, and a liberal arts study. What's interesting about that, I would imagine, it, you know, it's kind of a, sh you know, geographically you, you, you shift, but also you have time to reflect and look back. Well, and as a matter of fact, you know, college was actually a great place for me to focus because in high school, I was all over the place. I was heading down, you know, that path of, like, you know, not, not serious, serious trouble, but like on the verge of getting into really serious trouble and doing fucking, you know, just not good stuff. And so, uh, yeah, when I went to college, I think I had made a promise to myself and I think a promise to my parents because I had put them through a lot, as I think a lot of us have. And... Uh, so I, I really wanted to excel at college. And so in college is where I kind of really tried to make good, you know, and, and I was out of the city, I was in the woods of New Hampshire. And the, and the beautiful thing about it is that it was not an art school. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the art classes, you know, uh, they, they were taught by serious professors. Um, and so, you know, but a lot of people took them as blow off classes or, you know, they, you know so they could keep their, their, their grade point average up. But the teachers, whether it was photography or drawing or painting uh, or graphic design, the teachers all saw that I was like really serious about all this stuff. So they all kind of took me under their wing and gave me access to uh, dark room stuff where not everyone had. I had access to large canvases I could paint, stuff like that. So that really was a huge uh, help for, for my growth in, in that way. But, but I still, even in college, I still really had, you know, I knew I wanted to be an artist and I knew that that's what I wanted to do and I wanted to kind of work for myself, but I still didn't really have a plan at all. Right, but you figured out a plan, right? And that was to create the zine, the skills, the skills. Well, right, and, right. And, and, and that's, that, that to me is really interesting, right? That's why I say the distance kind of like uh, is very interesting in retrospect when you look back at, the, at your true passion. Yeah, well, I mean, the magazine was, you know, really the culmination of everything that I really enjoyed. I enjoyed graffiti. I enjoyed, at this point, documenting graffiti. Uh, I enjoyed design. Um, and I also, uh, and collage. This was really where, you know, I had been doing collage and graffiti probably as, you know, around the same amount of time. But they never, the, those two worlds never really, they kind of ran parallel to each other until mm -hmm. I did this magazine. And then it kind of, it kind of all came together in that way. So yeah, so this magazine and this particular issue, number five, uh, with that cover was a very personal thing. There's a lot of personal effects in there, things that were used during the 80s when I was writing on trains. Well, actually, oh, not this cover. That, that's that's actually, the other one, yeah. That's actually a photo by Adam Cost. But yeah, this one, uh, you know, these are, these are, you know, labels of things that I racked. Uh, there's a, an empty bag of crazy Eddie angel dust. If people remember that era, yes. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I was curious about that. I was going to ask about that um, because it takes a certain New Yorker mindset and person to understand what crazy Eddie was all about. And if Doze was on this, he would be screaming like, Oh my God. But uh, well, did crazy Eddie seem to be aligned with the, the appetites of graffiti writers. Let's just say that. Let's just say that. But again, here's what's interesting. What I like about this, okay, is that you, and this, there are two, two ways of, to think about this for me. One, um, child's play, right? And, and the kind of, uh, the, the, the innocence and the recall of a child, uh, you know, puts together his scrapbooks and stuff. Sure. Um, and, but also in, in the terms of the, the collage practice, right? We, we, you know, which uh, uh, one of my favorite artists created, George Brock, along with Picasso, right? Uh, about yeah. Collaging uh, typography on an image space, right? And 
Um, and you had, you had mentioned Joseph Cornell, another artist that I really love. And again, you're doing this naively, so to speak, right? This is- Well, I mean, I had been exposed to some art as a kid. My parents were very much into art. They were both art history majors in college. So, you know, I went to galleries and museums with them. Uh, and so, you know, just off the top, yeah, Joseph Cornell, uh, Kurt Schwitters, yes. um, uh, Red Grooms. Th those are, when I was young, those are artists that were very, very influential to me growing up. So you, 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 what, the next part of this, which I'm really fascinated by, is um, how you take that and you start, um, you know, constructing typography um, from various uh, sources of uh, publications from times ago. Tell, tell me about how you arrived at this Coming, coming from this to this, what was going on? What, what, what was uh, the motive? Well, the thing for me with collage is that I, I make a, a, a kind of vast array of different types of collages that are all kind of, you know, rooted from the same place or, in, or come from a similar place of inspiration. But there's many different styles, you know, and, and a lot of these things, again, when I'm making, you know, when I'm doing my studio work, I'm doing collage work or painting and stuff like that, I'm not trying to emulate graffiti, but I'm absolutely trying to take some of the aesthetics and the energy and the dynamics and symmetry and stuff like that from graffiti and put it into the work. And so for me, you know, like you were saying earlier on, I mean, for me, letters is, you know, and, and the, the reinvention and deconstruction and reconstruction of letters is just something that's never, it just is always exciting to me. And so, uh, you know, having that kind of background and doing, you know, burners and pieces and stuff like that, when I finally arrived at this place with my collage work, I, you know, I did a bunch of word pieces and letter pieces and stuff like that. And that also kind of riffs off of, you know, uh, negative space and, and things being layered and, and kind of layers of graffiti and layers of, of, of lettering and, and posters and stuff like that. But um, yeah, these, these pieces, um, you know, were, were specific to, you know, they're, they're a limited color palette, which is also something I like to play with. I also obviously I like to play with negative space. And so, you know, I, um, yeah, I, I just try and kind of evolve the style. And I mean, you know, I mean, I think a lot of graffiti writers and a lot of artists, period, I'm sure yourself included, it's like you, you doodle a bunch of ideas and you sketch down a bunch of ideas. And those, th that idea that you like, oh, hey, I really like this idea. That idea turns into two ideas and then five ideas and then 10 ideas and then so forth and so on. And so sometimes I find it hard to even catch up to, to all the ideas that I want to really you know, bring to fruition, you know? So a lot of the stuff you'll see is very different because I'm very interested in making series. And uh, so, yeah, so there'd be a lot of, so there's a lot of variety, but it's all, again, it's all kind of connected and based in collage. And for me, collage is uh, very much the jumping off point. You right. Know, and, and, and I'm going to reiterate this is that you hand cut the paper mm -hmm. and paste it. And it's, it, you know, mechanical studies. This is so analog. And that's what I really appreciate about it. Uh, because this is easy to is easy to do now with uh, Adobe Illustrator. Uh, yeah. I, I, let me just reframe that. It's easy to re-illustrate, right? Uh, to conceive of this is another sure. thing, right? Because I, I think I got to give you props for what you conceive and what you're seeing and, and reconstructing. And um, it, 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 as a sculptor, it speaks to me because I, in fact, I actually love working more with my remnants than, you know, the, the, the material I use in a finished piece, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, well, the same thing happened to me. And I definitely, there are, I have a whole series of things that are literally the leftover cuttings of these more kind of graphic pieces like this, like what's left over from this. I have pieces that are made out of those pieces. Yeah, but you also take another shift, which is quite interesting because you become very literal, uh, very strong type faces. Um, strong messaging, right? Uh, and, and what I'm curious about with, with this series is, because you're departing from something else, and why would you go so literal? Uh, well, I mean, I think there was a while where I was really interested in doing things that, you know, were sayings or phrases, um, you know, and, you know, kind of having a little bit of fun with them. I mean, this piece, the hustle piece is really interesting because this is one of the first prints that I did, uh, you know, kind of with a really, uh, you know, great printer, a uh, guy named Luther. Uh, and so this 
and it, this also came out in 2008, literally in October when the stock market crashed. So this piece automatically for me had new meaning that like we're all going to have to rethink our hustle. But the initial inspiration for this piece is when I used to play Little League in Queens and Forest Hills, my coach at the time, you know, as you can remember, they're like these sort of overzealous parents and all this stuff going on is they would say, hustle, 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 hustle. <laughs> and so that's so, you know, in mining for ideas, for pieces, you know, sometimes you go back, you know. Yeah. And, and, and again, the, the, the word dictates the design, right? Because there is something like of a, 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 a kind of hustling for space, uh, a font space in this, you know, from, uh, in, in dimension. Yeah, well, I mean, it's again, it's, it's all, you know, it's different styles. I mean, I think, you know, graffiti, you know, kind of graffiti allows you to explore all these different styles. There's simples, there's wild style, there's this. And so it's really just trying to translate a lot of that stuff, you know, and those ideas and that energy and that movement to something else, you know. Greg, but now that you're exploring this, I mean, how, how aware, how is your awareness of uh, the history of typography and typesetting uh, is, is uh, not I mean not really I mean I did I did major in graphic design in college so I mean I had you know I I definitely kerned some letters in my life but uh, I'd say I probably I'm more like on the unorthodox more um, what's it called the um, you, more casual side of things uh, right as far as you know I don't uh, I, I'm much more into making my own letters and and making my own composition with letters and kind of you know, not necessarily using the same font or the same letters. Uh, so some of it is a little bit, uh, you know, untraditional, is, is, you know, as far as maybe straight, you know, font, you know, typesetting and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think I more just was into, um, you know, graffiti lettering and just, you know, really trying to evolve that idea into other lettering. I mean, like this piece, the, the piece you just had up there, it's like, Part of the inspiration for this piece is when you look, uh, you know, you, you know, for, for, for someone who doesn't know graffiti, um, you would look at a wall that has like a bunch of tags on it and it, it really wouldn't make a lot of sense to you. And so there was something about that that I really enjoyed is that like there, it's just, it, it is kind of to most people, it is kind of abstract. And so pieces like this, and I did a series of these pieces as well, was kind of, again, not trying to emulate what that is exactly but kind of give you this idea of just like all these layered names and fra fragmented and fractured names and things that are all kind of layered on top of each other. Right. But it's interesting because you give it a very, it's, it's chaotic in its way, but it's like so neatly and, and really like so structured, you know, really well, well, well executed. Well, it's very geometric. It's all yeah. you know, squares and rectangles and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, it just, it really riffs off of the color, you know, the colors. Right and stuff like that. I mean, I'm still, my, my color sensibility is still very much stuck in the seventies and old, old spray paint colors and stuff like that. I still, I still really enjoy my, right. you know, whether it's a uh, cascade green or avocado or, or Adobe orange or topaz yellow. I still, I still really enjoy those colors. Right. Super cool. And this one was interesting to, for me because uh, uh, again, the shape that you, you place the, the letter forms, yeah, you're going very geometric, uh, you know, very dynamic, uh, no order, no rhyme or reason. Well, again, it's like, you know, this is, you know, I, I did a series of these pieces as well. And, and this is, you know, this is basically fragments upon fragments, but it's, it's like, kind of, I always call these pieces kind of two pieces in one, in the sense that there's the piece of the pieces that are actually collaged to the piece of paper. And then the negative space in the thin kind of white lines, which kind of mimic an outline. Uh, and so, you know, th those are the things that I'm kind of looking at when I make these pieces. It's like, it, again, it's not supposed to be, you know, uh, uh, graffiti, but like those thin white lines that, that outline pieces and out and kind of, you know, especially, you know, I, I think we all have a love for those pieces with, with you know, like a darker color fill-ins with a white outline or a light colored outline. And uh, so this kind of is like, you know, encapsulating that idea of like the white outline around all these kind of, you know, uh, dynamic colors. Yeah. And one of the things that's a curiosity for me is that, um, and, and it's actually really what I really appreciate about the work is the labor involved with the work because, uh, 
I mean, it takes some effort. I mean, you could easily say, well, you know what, I'll just do this on, on a computer. Um, what, yeah. what's, kept, what's kept you from, from going that way? Well, I mean, I, def I definitely do digital work and I definitely do Illustrator, but as time goes on, I really try to stay away from the computer as much as possible. And again, I think it's just the time that I grew up. I mean, I grew up doing cut and paste and uh, when I first did graphic design. And so it's just something that stuck with me. I mean, you were, you were mentioning before about kind of like the childlike nature of all that stuff. And there's a truth to that, but there's also, you know, my mother, she did collage and she had a small studio outside my bedroom. And so I would see that as a very young kid. And so I think that also played a big influence on me, uh, you know, just watching her do collages and having scraps of paper and all this kind of stuff around. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of grew up with that stuff. So, um, you know, and also too, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, this, the, the paper and stuff like that, I literally try and use, you know, every, all the parts, like we were saying before, like the remnants, the leftovers, you know, I, I definitely try and use everything and, and recycle everything. And, you, and let's face it, a lot of the materials that are used are things that are, you know, discarded or wouldn't, you know, wouldn't really be around unless I kept them. Right. And, but you have a special interest in, in period, period paper. Well, I've been very lucky. A long time ago, I'd say around, oh God, 2003 maybe, I was going to paint a wall in East New York uh, and I was a little early and I found a place under the, under the, the L on Jamaica Avenue that was selling records on the street. And I could, we collect the records a little bit. And long story short is um, I went inside the store and it was, it, it, they weren't letting people inside. They only sold stuff out on the street during the summer. But inside the store was one whole wall from top to, top to bottom in a, an old stationary supply store. It was still intact. So for many years, I started to buy supplies from this place. And they had stuff from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s that literally had never seen the light of day. And they're like, I, I love all that stuff because it's super rich lithography and super rich um, silk screening. And the colors, like I said, I'm still kind of stuck on like these kind of old 50s, 60s, 70s colors. Mm -hmm. And so there was a richness and boldness to all the materials they had there. So for many, many years, I would go there uh, almost every weekend during the summers and just dig through piles and piles of stuff. And uh, so I was able that and that finding that store really changed my whole practice. One of the things, too, that I should mention, you know, is that while some of these works for, for many folks may feel very abstract, um, it's important to understand the kind of uh, graphism, so to speak, that you embed into the work, right? Uh, in this particular piece, yeah. uh, arrow. The, the arrow, which is obvious, but this one, which wasn't so obvious to me, and I appreciate that you, you pointed this out to me, uh, 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 and, and I'll let you reiterate what you told me about this piece. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, for me, you know, a lot of the a lot of the collage work is is also kind of, you know, it's it's fragmented. It's it's taking something out of context and giving it a new meaning. So, you know, these pieces, I would look I would kind of consider it like sampling in a way. So it's like you kind of try and find like, you know, the, you know, with, with like a piece, there's like a, a certain place where like an arrow kicks out and the 3D just looks nice with the nice little three lines in the 3D and it just looks good. And so I would try and pick these pieces out and like, you know, with graffiti and lettering, it's like, you know, shadows and 3D and all that stuff is such a huge part of it. So the, this piece is literally just all the letter O and kind of cut out to kind of look like there's a big 3D behind it. But the other part of it too, is that it kind of looks, you know, it's kind of like drip, you know, drips. And yeah. that was something that I kind of happened. I didn't really think about it as I was, until I started really making them. I said, oh shit, these kind of look like drips. And, um, and but it's also really more just it's really kind of like adding like this extra 3D to a letter is really what the mm -hmm. initial idea was. And then also playing with the negative space. Like sometimes I would make these these pieces and I wouldn't really be quite sure where they would go and, you know, where the negative space, you know, would how, how it would kind of end up. So um, but uh, but again, it's like, you know, a lot of lot, a lot of the elements are there. There's letters, colors and, uh, yeah. and like kind of three dimensional, you know, sensibility. Yeah. Um, and, and this piece, which um, it threw me off. I mean, I really like it, but I, I had no idea that it it, it says vestige. Yes. Um, and uh, and it's it, it's nice because it took some time for me to really invest myself in it. 
uh, to really find what what was really in it. Um, uh, I think I don't know if most people do that. You know what I mean? And no. Well, well, I mean, also too, it's like you know, like we were talking about the, the other pieces before that are more literal. It's like you know, and I think I think a lot of artists, you know, go through these kind of processes where you're doing something. Uh, you know, I was doing these very literal pieces, et cetera, stuff. And I think after time, you really want to kind of loosen up and you want to like, you want to break out of that and still use letters and use letter forms to to communicate, but uh, but also not make it so literal because, you know, a lot of times people look at a literal work and, you know, they read it and they go, okay, hey, okay, great, you know, get busy or whatever, it, you know, whatever it may say. And so to me, I started to gravitate towards taking those letter forms and kind of you know, like this piece, you know, spreading them, spreading them across yep. and just completely, sma you know, smash. I mean, this piece is, you know, kind of like broken glass in a way. So it's like, you know, it's kind of smashing all that. Um, at the same time, I'm still making those pieces because in a lot of ways, a piece like this uh, at the time couldn't really be made without the, the very literal graphic design pieces because these are all the remnants from those pieces. <laughs> Correct. But also something interesting comes into play too, right? It is kind of that painterly effect, uh, that great gradation, let's just say from red, yep. blue to white, yep. uh, which is interesting. Um, uh, here we have this, uh, you know, your, your fireworks collage, uh, which is interesting because I've always liked that, that, uh, that, that tissue paper they had. It's kind of yeah. like that, that really light. Well, I mean, again, you know, when I first started making collages, that is literally where, you know, hanging out in the schoolyard where everyone, you know, even, you know, is smoking weed, blowing off fireworks. I mean, in Queens, where I grew up f during the summer, fireworks was a big deal. And people, there was a, there were these brothers that sold fireworks every year, every summer, people bought fireworks. I mean, it was like a big deal. So when I, d I didn't even know what rolling papers were really, but I would, I would kind of mine the schoolyard and I'd pick up all the graffiti, uh, all the wrappers, uh, from the fireworks and I pick up easy wider packs and bamboo packs because I was into the graphics. Like I, I identified with the graphics even, even kind of before or literally around the same time that I was really starting to understand what graffiti was. And so uh, this, this collage is like from 1989, probably uh, around then. And so the, the firework collages were literally some of the first collages I ever made. Uh, and, and I, and I kind of, I still do a couple every year. Uh, around the 4th of July, but, you know, I, I don't do them as much as I'd like, but I, I definitely do, I definitely revisit that. Uh, I try and revisit that every year because it is really a, very much a starting point for me. So here we get into interesting territory. And, and when we were discussing this, this direction, again, it alludes to a couple of things, you know, it, it alludes to kind of a distressed environment, uh, the subways, you know, how they're always peeling off stuff. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I had asked you about, ref, you know, what, what was the point of reference for something like this? Because the, obviously the, the other works are, are really referencing the, uh, the, the, the papers you resource and, and typography and stuff like this. Um, here it's something else. Well, I mean, the, the letters, the letters are still there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the inspiration for these pieces, I mean, this is, this is a piece, this is, this is from a series of pieces that I made uh, from, from traveling to Sardinia, uh, the island of Sardinia in Italy. And uh, after going there many times, you know, like a lot of European uh, cities and towns on the highways, there's all these posters for circuses and car shows and concerts and, and they're just, they're never, they're kind of just layered on. Like they, it's not like they, they take a poster down and then they put up another. It's like, they're just completely layered upon. And so, you know, as, as you well know, you know, traveling just kind of opens up the creative. I mean, you, you, when, when you go traveling, that's, that's one of the things that you're, you're open to. As soon as you start seeing things, you're, you're absorbing things immediately. And so when I went to Sardinia, this was one of the things that I absorbed. Uh, and, and so I, you know, ran up and down the highways and ripped a lot of these posters off. I folded them all up and, and brought them back and, and, and made them in my studio in Manhattan. Uh, and and it, it, it kind of brought me back to when I first started making collage and just kind of ripping pieces of uh, firework papers. But also too, I kind of, what that trip helped me kind of realize was also that I kind of fell in love with fluorescent color. <laughs> you know, like a piece like this, 
So this is, again, like we were talking before, this is very much, you know, more inspired by the New York subway system and the posters and the layering of posters. And, and something I've always been into is, is all the little kind of uh, chunks of paint that are taken out on the poles. And you can see all the various colors that the poles have been painted over the years. And so I, I started kind of, you know, it's one, kind of one of those ideas that you do a bunch of sketches in a sketchbook and, you know, I didn't really realize or, you know, I was working on other things. And then last year I really gave myself the license to, you know, work on more abstract pieces. I mean, again, letters are always going to be part of it. Um, right. But, and uh, what, what I like too is that you're opening up space with solid colors and forms. Um, yeah. You know, and, and again, one of the things that we were talking about, I, I think for me anyway, one of the things that really fast has always fascinated me was uh, our our culture relative to contemporary art and the things that we kind of innately stumble upon that are, are uh, both practice and theories uh, established by generations before us. Um, and in particular, you know, the, the ABEX guys and abstract expressionists. And um, we, we briefly discussed, uh, um, you know, um, so you, you mentioned to me some artists that, uh, you know, Village and uh, Rotelio. Yeah, Domingo Rotelio and, and, and Jack Villager and, and Raymond Haynes are all very famous for using, uh, you know, ripped poster, street posters and movie posters as, as, uh, as uh, you know, their main source of inspiration. So, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely familiar with their work. Uh, and, you know, I think what, like, you know, from that piece before, when I, moment when I, when I kind of fell in love with that whole idea. And, you know, as far as, you know, those guys and, and, and all that kind of stuff, I mean, what's happening or what hopefully is happening, whether it's graffiti or fine art, or collage, what have you, is that there's a lineage. And yes. there's, there's things that are, you know, everyone's trying to, you know, create their own voice and create their own imagery. And, 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 but, you know, obviously a huge part of that is the stuff that came before and trying to build upon that, but evolve it and, and, and make it your own, you know? Yeah. So that, that's what I've really tried to do is that, you know, I have tremendous respect for, uh, you know, some of these guys and these collage artists and stuff like that, that I, that I looked up to, you know, growing up, but I, I kind of look at it as like, I'm, you know, there was an artist in Lower East Side, a guy named John Evans, a collage artist, and he, he was very well known for making a collage every single day for almost 20 years. And uh, so, you know, someone like that, you know, I, I was very lucky to become friends with him uh, before he passed away. Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, I, I felt like, you know, even though his style and my style are very different, I, I felt the passing of the torch a little bit. With, with him and, and, and a couple of other people that I've been luckily uh, been able to, to, to meet and, and know a little bit. And, and what I like, uh, again, one has to consider an artist's story and narrative and background. And that's why I love doing these talks, right? Because there's sometimes, in a, and again, this day and age, when, when a young artist discovers an artist, they own that, ex they try to own that, that, that aesthetic, that look. Um, and right. yours, right. yours is generated from an actual experience, both personal, like you mentioned, within your family environment, uh, but also living in New York, right? Which is a very heavily yes. textured, hex, textured city. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it is something that is, is just, it, it happens almost naturally, right? Well, New, New York will forever be the muse. You know what I mean? Yeah. New York will forever be a muse in my work. And, and I'm sure a lot of other people, I mean, it's just this, you know, growing up here and living here, you know, it's just, it's, it's just, it's a part of, you know, it's a part of who you are. And, and especially being a part of the graffiti uh, culture. I mean, that, that's one, that's actually one of the things that's really amazing about graffiti is that like, not only do you live in New York city, uh, but you're a part of New York city, you know, right. you're part, you're part of that landscape, you know, and that, that's always something that's been, you know, a great relate, you know, it's just a great relationship to have, you know. Right, right. Because, you know, this is a signed city going back as far as one could imagine. I, I could only imagine the, the hand, uh, the, 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 the building painters from back in the day that did all the adverts, you know, that had. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, we, I mean, you and I grew up in a time where everything was hand done. And so to me, that's something I still keep, you know, that I, I still keep on, like doing things by hand. Yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, you can do a lot of things on computer and there's nothing wrong with computers. But um, but for me, it's like, especially when making fine art or you know my studio practice, I wanted to have my touch. I wanted to have, 
you know, like even some of the earlier pieces that were more pristine, uh, the pieces I make now are, are, I mean, they're still pristine to, a, to an extent, but I definitely want there to be, you know, a sensibility that this was touched by, you know, by me, you know, that I, this was, this was made by hand. That, that's interesting because as, as an artist, <clears throat> I, I've been, I, I mean, I love, I love analog, but I, 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 I completely love tech. I love automation. Well, you were, you were early. You, 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 you've been, you've been at the forefront of that for quite a while. Yeah, but no, but what's interesting for me is that um, my, of all people, my brother Kel, because he comes from, he went to, he went to the high school of printing, right? And that, that's all analog tradition. You work in an apprentice in a proper print shop and typesetting and all yep, of this. Yep. And um, we, we, we all learned how to, you know, try to set type by hand and design type by hand. But when the computer came around and this software called Fontographer came out, <laughs> we, were, we were like, yo, let's build a graffiti typography, you know, when uh, this was like when in early, early, early 90s, when nobody even had a computer at home. And no, I remember, I mean, just as a, as a, as a side note, I remember uh, going to your guys' studio when you guys were in Williamsburg sometime in the early 90s with, with Chino and being kind of blown away. You guys had all these computer monitors and stuff going on. And it was, it was, I'll never forget it. It was, I'd never seen anything like that. At, at that time, it was, it was you know, to yeah. see you kind of at, at that, the forefront of all that stuff was really. I, I mean, think about it. Is it's if if you're not trained um, uh, technically, right? To kind of, I mean, it's hard to get an image like this, or or for a young artists to get an image like this today, analog, so to speak. If you were really to, you know, I mean, let's be real. It, there, there's there's a certain knowledge. Uh, that's associated and an analog knowledge that's associated with this um that is um so essential to the process and the outcome uh with the computer um it it, it, it has a different look it has a different feel so to speak uh, and again uh, because there is something about the paper and the transparency of papers on, on layers and and the kind of uh uh lift so to speak that collage gives your work sure uh in the gluing process um that i absolutely love um but i understand the importance of uh fine tuning and automating a process to arrive um at the same point of satisfaction so to speak um not, i'm not saying the same type of out outcome in terms of the artwork per se but that same type of personal satisfaction in trying to solve a creative problem. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I mean, you know, the, the piece you have up there now, you know, there's obviously this piece is a little bit more message driven. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think to, to, to add on to what you were just saying, I mean, for me, you know, collage is such a, it, 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 it's a very pure art form not only because it's something that maybe we all did as we were kids when we were in kindergarten and first grade and they had the little tinfoil trays with the chunk of paste in it, uh, but it's it's something that, you know, all, all these pieces of paper and, and things that, that, that culminate in these works, you know, had different meanings and different lives, you know, different, you know, lives before they kind of got to me. And so to be able to kind of harness those things and put it together and, you know, recontextualize it and make something completely new, uh, just, you know, always, it was, it's just, it's just, you know, so, always. So tell really me, if, if I, if I, sorry for, for interjecting, but tell me, what does this mean? What message? Are well, you, this is, you know, I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, you know, this, this particular piece is that, you know, obviously they've, they've over time, New York has been overdeveloped. They've kind of loosened the reins and let, you know, uh, developing of all these wild buildings and stuff like that. So this particular piece just says develop, destroy, develop, destroy. But also behind that, there's like three very kind of classic looking buildings, but kind of looming in the background is this very kind of rope, very plain glass kind of, you know, kind of uh, very plain looking building that, that, that doesn't, that's not very interesting, you know? And so that that's really that's really the whole meaning behind this piece is, is it's really okay. you know it's a it's it's a you know com I mean I made this piece probably in two thousand and five, so it was a comment you know on New York City and and what was kind of going on at that point. 
this series, I've always liked this, this series you would do where uh, letters would be flushed to one side or the other and there is this kind of movement, this. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I love playing with negative space and I love having things that have, a, you know, because I think some of these, some of the pieces that I make, like this one example, there's such a density to the, the, the formal part of it that for me, it needs some space to breathe to, to do just that, to create that movement and create that kind of layering and kind of uh, undulating sense of like, and even somewhat of a heaviness, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, I, yeah. I, I utilize it. It's interesting because, too, there's something that evokes, I, just as you were speaking, something that was evocative to me was that, you know, I just imagine you just turning over maybe like a box of letters and just... Well, you know, you're not, you're, you're not wrong. I mean, part of the process, you know, from, from even transitioning from doing the more literal pieces is that, like, pieces like this were really born out of, you know, I, a lot of the work I did was very cyclical. I would, I would get hunt and gather materials. Then I would spend weeks at a time cutting, you know, hundreds of letters and pieces. And then they'd be laid out on my desk or, 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 or on, you know, somewhere in the studio. And I maybe would bump into something or knock into something or I'd drop something. And all of these uh, compositions kind of started happening. So, yeah, th there's definitely part of my practice where I, I, I employ more uh, chance. Yeah, I was just going to say, happenstance matters, man. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, whereas, like, this one is very, you know, it's very uh, purposeful. Like, this is meant to be this way. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, the natural progression of things is that one wants to loosen up and kind of, uh, you know, play, you know, kind of, uh, you know, play with things and not be so rigid, you know, sometimes. Greg, not, you, you, you refine this concept, this idea, this look, right, this signature for yourself. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're able to parlay that into, into you know, uh, real world advertising. Uh, it, it makes sense. And it's funny that, you know, we would be having this conversation today because earlier today um, I was in an office and they had an issue of communication design. And, uh, you know, as I'm flipping through it, I'm looking at the type, type designers and the things they're doing. And it's, and it, and it, and it, and it's interesting because it, you know, how, how we look and use typography now, um, it's really interesting. I, 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 I don't know exactly what to say about what I saw today and relating it back to your work, but that um, the typography is, uh, the, uh, our, our, uh, our type literacy, let's just say, type design literacy has gotten so much better. Yeah, I mean, well, I think I also think too that like people have finally kind of come around to letters and letter-driven work and graffiti type. I mean, I would say you know within the last you know I don't know how however many years you want to call it, you know, people can be a lot more informed about this stuff. So, you know, th there's a much I think there's a much better appreciation and understanding of you know graffiti lettering and you know even like this piece like this piece I was done for New York Magazine. It's like again, it's not graffiti. But it, you know, it has a lot of the same characteristics that for me make, you know, that are exciting about graffiti and are exciting about working with letters. And so I think that that is appealing to people now because, you know, let's face it, you know, the, 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 the train era is, you know, back in the 80s and stuff like that. And so a lot of the people who are now, you know, in business or in advertising firms or you know, art directors and stuff like that, they have a, they have a much better appreciation for this stuff, I feel like. I, I would agree with you. And, and us as a public, uh, we're okay with living with it. And, and as we go from something like this and how that translates in the real world, I, I, I you know, you, you've done that very successfully um, and in, in a very novel way, so to speak, uh, because now you're, you, you're traversing these spaces, right? From graffiti artists to muralists and, um, and I emphasize that, and I and I think I, I try to emphasize this as much as I can to our audience between that dialogue between what is street art, what is graffiti art, um, and I, I I like to lean um, towards uh, muralism when I discuss works like this. And yeah, you know, it's it, it's funny. I, I sometimes I struggle with this in some ways because you know when I think of murals, 
you know, I think of like the WPA murals or Diego Rivera or like those, to me, those are murals. And I'm not saying that this work here isn't a mural, but for me, I feel like these are wall paintings and, 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 and it's, it's in, it's, it's in the same, uh, you know, conversation with muralism, but it's, uh, to me, murals are a very specific thing. So I, I like to consider these things more wall paintings. Uh, I mean, maybe that's just semantics. I don't know, but I just, I, I guess maybe I'm old fashioned, but when I, I think of murals, I really think of some of those well, very classic, you know. Right, you're, you're a romantic and I, and I get it. Yeah. I, I, I get it. But, but you can always... tell by the lighting, you know. Yeah, I, I, I get it. It's, it, you know, again, it, but it's, it's one of those things that I've often found very interesting um, in terms of, uh, you know, vernacular, right? And that there's something about um, the term street art sometimes that cheapens the, the, the perception of the work, so to speak. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, quality. I mean, you know, I mean there's, there's obviously been this kind of push and pull conversation between graffiti and street art for, for a long time now. And like, you know, I think both I think both street art and graffiti have benefited from each other in some ways because obviously there was such an explosion of street art. And I think that that, that light that street art got kind of shed a little bit more light on graffiti and, you know, as you say, style writing. And so, as I was saying before, I think more people have a little bit more knowledge about that kind of stuff yeah. and a little bit more appreciation for it. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, I mean, ultimately everything is, you know, if you're doing stuff in the street, it's, it's, you know, you could say it's street art, but, um, you know, I, I, I try not to get caught up too much in that stuff. I feel like there's horrible stuff in graffiti. There's amazing stuff in graffiti. Yeah. There's great stuff in street art and there's horrible stuff in street well, art. Well, there's something, you know what, if this is a perfect segue into, in, into, cause we're gonna, what we're gonna do now folks is we're gonna take a pause. I'm gonna save the video and rejoin Greg oh, okay. uh, for the next part. But, you know, leaving, uh, the, uh, leaving on that note about um, uh, your particular practice, right, where you have developed this aesthetic, this look that identifies you and your interests that is really uh, easy to access for the general public, but by no means does that mean that you have abandoned your original uh, 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 love and love affair for graffiti. In fact, you've refined it. In fact, you pay homage to it with some of the works that we're going to show next. So, um, Folks, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a pause for the cause and just give me a minute. Uh, Greg, stay put. Now I'll uh, I'll come back on once I save this video. You got it. Okay. <laughs> 